Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So my graphic novel launches on Indiegogo this Friday. So that's where I'm spending most of my time trying to get that ready. And by the way, if you still want to get that free exclusive pinup poster with your book when you order it, you have to sign up before we launch. And so that's within the next couple of days. But I've been spending most of my time trying to get that up and running, which is a task. So I'm probably going to give you a shorter video today. That's what I think at the first of this anyways. It may not turn out that way. But some people like my shorter videos, so I guess that's okay. And I want to go over some information that most of us accept as true. But I want to put it all together to talk about where it comes from and why it's here and what it means for the future. Because we have a bit of a bleak future coming for us at this point. It is certainly going to be a dark winter, and it has begun already. And I'm going to start it with a part of pop culture that I don't usually focus on. I'm not going to talk about comics or comic book heroes today, although I'm going to talk about heroes very slightly, but I'm going to talk about movies, and in particular, buddy cop movies, or at the very least, that's where I'm going to begin. And the question is, what happened to buddy cop movies? Where did they come from? Why were they there? And why do we no longer have them? And it is something very telling to what we have to face today, because buddy cop movies are based upon juxtaposition. And there are a lot of those movies within the 80s and early 90s. And you don't see them anymore today because this juxtaposition no longer holds. Now, the thing about this kind of juxtaposition that you see in buddy cop movies, it can generate both drama and comedy at the same time. And that's why it was such a good vehicle to use to tell a story. But the question again becomes, where did it come from? And why was it only specific to that time frame of the 80s and early 90s? Well, the thing is that this juxtaposition you saw in buddy cop movies was a juxtaposition of two different individuals that normally you would not see together. And this was the point. The point is that in the 70s, you saw a mashing together of all different kinds of people. You saw a destruction of the idea of segregation, not just segregation itself. Because before that, up until the 60s, you had segregation. At the very least, you had segregation in a cultural sense. That is to say, we have our own kind. We're going to stick to our own kind. We are going to stay over here in our own area. We're not going to mix with you and you don't mix with us. But within the 70s, you see a destruction of this idea culturally. And so within the 80s and 90s, what you have is a mashing together of all these different kinds of people, all these different kinds of cultures, so that they have to deal with each other. And therefore, we get these two different kinds of people, these two different kinds, usually of cops or sometimes cop adjacent. And you put them together and there is a juxtaposition of two different kinds of people. And so this is what brings about the drama and this is what brings about the comedy. Because again, people simply were not used to this. And this is where the buddy cop movie came from. And this is why the buddy cop movie is no longer around. Because, well, let's take some examples. If you look at a very good example of the first of this buddy cop trend, you would look at 48 hours. Now within 48 hours, I can't remember, who's the guy who played the white cop? I can't, it's not Gary Busey, who was it? Anyways, but a lot of the things, and this is the early 80s, a lot of the things the white cop said in that movie, a lot of people would look at today and go, oh, that's, that's overtly racist, what he just said there. You could never get away with saying that today. And that's the way it was in the early 80s. But if you look at, I would say, more towards the end of the buddy cop movie, you would look at something like Lethal Weapon 4. Again, you had a juxtaposition of these two kinds of cops, but at the same time, within that storyline, you had a very small little scene where they talked about the segregation in South Africa and how it was a bad thing. And so what you saw at the beginning of this buddy cop trend was the fact that, yeah, you have different cultures and yeah, they're not going to agree with each other. And yeah, sometimes they're nasty to each other, but that's just the way it is. But by the end of it, you had culture changed enough so that everybody agreed that segregation was bad. Everybody agreed that no, we shouldn't be segregated. And really, you should look at anybody who segregates other people as being wrong. Now, I'll have to stop right here and insert the fact that I'm going to talk about segregation in neutral terms as much as possible. Because I would say that there is a positive 
and there is a negative to segregation in some way. One of the people that I listen to a lot on the internet, not so much lately, is Dr. Steve Turley. And Dr. Steve Turley is always talking about the fact that there is a re-traditionalization going on within the world. There is a rejection of globalism and people are re-traditionalizing and they're getting together in smaller and smaller groups. And what he says and has been saying for a while is the fact that you're going to see a balkanization of countries within the next century. You're going to see these large countries break up because you're going to get smaller and smaller groups of people who agree with each other in a specific area and they're going to say, okay, this is our area and we are a small group of people. And yes, our borders are going to segregate us from you because we have our own culture and our own traditions and yes, they're different from yours, but that's okay. You can have yours, we'll have ours. Now again, I would say that there are types of segregation that are certainly negative, but I wouldn't paint every segregation with the same brush. Some people putting up borders, yes, it's segregating yourself. And the way that it's talked about in these terms is that it's an extension of a family. It's a larger family. I'm Scottish, so your clan is your family. It's your extended family. So yeah, we're going to stick to our own clan because we have similar cultures and traditions and we get along with each other and things move smoothly when we deal with each other. So that's what it's going to be. So again, it's up to you to determine whether or not any of these things are positive or negative. I'm just going to talk about them in neutral terms as much as possible. But again, the point of the buddy cop movie, which I just started this off with, is the fact that you had this genre of movies, I guess you call it a genre, and it was there in that specific area of time because you had a destruction of segregation, which put all these different kinds of people together. It created this juxtaposition and therefore it caused a good vehicle for storytelling within both drama and comedy. And when you get to the end of it, you get ridiculous kind of buddy cop movies like K-9 or Kindergarten Cop, where you no longer have anything to juxtapose because your audience is used to this so much that it's not going to be new. They already know what's going on. They've already laughed the laughs. Therefore, they put it into the ridiculous. And that's what these later buddy cop movies actually were about. And again, that's why you no longer see this because culture accepted that, yeah, look, we're all together now. We're all in this together. We're not going to segregate ourselves. We're all just people. But fast forward from the late 90s to the late aughts which is your 08 to 2010, and specifically from 2010 to 2020. And what do you see? You see a re-segregation of people. And this is what has been going on within certainly the comic industry for a long time now. A lot of people were talking about in the last couple of months how it's ridiculous that these quote unquote progressive people are talking about the fact that if you have, let's say, a black lesbian cartoon character, you have to get a black lesbian to actually play that character because this character needs to be segregated to these qualities and these qualities alone. And I thought it was funny when everybody started talking about that because I was talking about that about a year, a year and a half ago when Marvel was doing it with Marvel Rising because they made sure that every actor that they hired to play these cartoon characters was exactly the same as the cartoon character themselves. And this is exactly what you saw within Marvel Comics. Only a Muslim writer can write this Muslim character. Only a woman writer can write this woman character. Only an Asian writer can write these Asian characters. And so on and so forth. And this is segregation. And again, we see this not just in comics, but also in books and movies as well. Certainly in books where you have a lot of these authors saying, look, I'm not actually going to put out my book because people are outraged about it because I talk about other cultures and I'm not of that culture. Again, this is segregation. So the world over the last 10 years, 12 years, I'd say, has begun to embrace segregation once again. But there is one important exception, and we all know this. There is one exception to the rule. Segregation is good for all of these cultures, except for white Europeans. They cannot be allowed to segregate themselves. And we see this statement everywhere, within the media, within culture, within governments, within multinational corporations and organizations. Movements that say things like, look, there's no such thing as English culture. England is not for the English. England belongs to all the immigrants. But of course, those immigrants, they're allowed to create their own segregated society within the country itself because their segregation is a good segregation. And the question then becomes, 
What is it about white European civilization that makes it the enemy to this kind of thinking? And by the way, I'll have to include the fact that if you participate in what the progressives call whiteness, you're just the same as a white European, even if you're in no way European, of European descent, or have white skin. If you participate in whiteness, you're the same as a white European. And whiteness, by the way, is ideas like pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Whiteness, by the way, is ideas like rationality. All of these things, which again, I did a video on the Smithsonian calling these things whiteness. If you participate in this kind of whiteness, you're the same as a white European. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter where your ancestors from. Doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. But thinking about this and why it actually comes to be, it makes the part of my brain that has been trained in history kick in and say, what's the difference between European civilization and all the rest of the civilizations that we see competing today within the world? Why do they, as the progressives would say, have all of this accumulated power? Why does this happen? Because we already know that Europeans are not the smartest in the world. Now, we may be a little bit above average, but we're nowhere near the smartest in the world. There are Oriental cultures that are far smarter than us. There are Jewish cultures that are far smarter than us. And I really wish I had a link for this, but I found a study to explain why this is. Why, even though Europeans are not the smartest, why they have such control and why they have such power and why they seem to be on top of a lot of things. Well, it comes down to the fact that smarts isn't everything. The study talked about the fact that drive what is what is most important. You could be the smartest person in the world, but if you don't have drive, you're not going anywhere. And again, this is, as I said, where my historical brain kicks in. What is it about the history of Europe that has given them this drive? I would say mainly it is geographical. It is the fact that you have this small area with all of these people and it is a harsh climate, but at the same time, it is cordoned off by a whole lot of natural boundaries. These natural boundaries historically allowed for civilizations to flourish in small areas, but at the same time, when they got big enough, they had to go over the mountain and had to compete with the other people on the other side of the mountain. And so you had plenty of wars and plenty of conflict. And in this kind of history, it is the strongest that survived. And the strongest were the ones who were able to look reality in the face, the cold, hard facts of reality, and say, okay, I don't like this, I don't want this, but this is the way it is, and I gotta deal with it. And again, just to give you some examples, this is the reason why we have Greek culture to begin with. It is the mountainous areas of Greece that protected it and allowed that culture to flourish. Just think back to the story of the 300 and think how influential the mountains were in that story and how it saved the Greek culture having those mountains there. The same can be true for Italy being cordoned off on its northern part by the mountains. The same can be seen within the history of Germany. Germany wasn't a country until, what was it, 1873? Before that, it was the Holy Roman Empire. And the reason why it wasn't able to unify before that, the reason why it was able to unify at that time, was because of the creation of dynamite. Dynamite allowed the country to blow up these mountains, or at the very least, blow holes in these mountains, so that they could connect all of the separate parts of this empire together through trains and allow it to become a unified country. It was the geography that was the driving force behind how this empire acted prior to this point and why it became a country after this point. Now, of course, I know there are plenty of other factors as well, but really, this geographical situation and the amount of conflict that it caused and how it caused it through these different little civilizations of people allowing themselves to flourish in a segregated place and then having to come in contact and conflict with each other was what brought about this drive for Europeans. That is what my historical training has taught me. And it is this drive, this drive that is needed for the European cultures to survive that forced them to take a cold Old, hard look at reality and say, okay, this is the way it is. I gotta recognize this. And I would say, again, the other part of my brain being political, because I studied first history and then politics, I would say that the cold hard truth that entered into the European mind for thousands of years is the fact that tribalism and politics just don't mix.
If you want to think about politics and have a good city, a good civilization, you gotta do it rationally. You can't do it according to my tribe says this, your tribe says that. You have to look at things, bear again, hard truth in the face and say, rationally, this is what we gotta do. And this is what makes the European, the white European, so dangerous. Because let's take, for example, American politics. Plenty of people have broken down the statistical analysis of election after election after election within the United States. And they have seen that you have certain kinds of people and they always vote in a specific way. Now, they might vote more or less in this specific way, but you can always tell how they're going to vote. But for white Europeans, you can't. They are a wild card. They look at the situation and say, okay, I understand, but I'm not going to go with the tribe on this one. I'm going to have to figure it out. What is the greatest benefit? I'm going to have to analyze this. And again, I'm not saying that every American says, okay, I got to sit down and think about this rationally and do this rationally. I would say, no, it's a part of their culture to say, okay, I'm not going to vote with the tribe. I'm going to figure this out. Maybe it's going to be emotionally. Maybe it's going to be according to my own wants and desires, but I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to go the way I'm going to go. And that's the point. Again, white Europeans are a wild card. This wild card nature, again, is brought about by looking reality square in the face. And this is why you see throughout European history, political treatise after political treatise after political treatise saying the same thing in different ways, but saying it over and over again. You gotta think about politics this way. You can't go with the tribe. You can't do like we used to do. This is not going to work. And again, this is what makes the white European so dangerous. And once again, I have to include the fact that anybody who participates in whiteness, as the progressives would say, it doesn't matter what color your skin is, doesn't matter where you're from, if you participate in whiteness, you're a white European, or the equivalent of one, so you might as well be. And this is why you can't allow the white Europeans to self-segregate. You can allow everybody else to self-segregate because everybody else is a standard measure. Everybody else is a card that you can count on. Everyone else has a fixed number. Some are twos, some are kings, some are queens, some are tens. And so you can figure out, you can figure out where they're going to go. You can figure out how they fit into everything and therefore you can control them. But the white European, nope, that's a wild card. And you can't allow that to exist because it puts everything in jeopardy. And quite specifically, because it's based upon politics, it puts the amassing of power in jeopardy. And that's why you're going to see over this dark winter that is coming for us, that's why you're going to see the media just strangle out any kind of dissenting voice. You're going to see cultural institutions like movies, like books, like comics. They're going to take what they've done for the last 10 years and just go full bore with it. You're going to see censorship in all its forms come into the public square. You're going to see it and you're going to experience it through the government, through big tech, through culture. It's going to be there and it's going to destroy all of these institutions and all of these areas that allow for white Europeans or people who think like a white European to congregate. It's going to destroy every one of them. That is what is going to happen. When you look about you in the next couple of months, in the next couple of years, and wonder why they are trying to get rid of this so badly, why they're trying to control this or that so much, why they are putting this kind of movie out, this kind of television show out, this kind of book out, why they're not allowing people to have their own social media accounts, why people are being banned. Why? Because they need to destroy the ability of the white European and the white European minded people from gathering together so that they can create for themselves their own area. They must destroy that. They must destroy it because that is a wild card and it will put in jeopardy their amassing of power. And I would say, if you've gotten to this point in my video, if you've gotten to a point where you've listened to me for I don't know how many minutes, you're a white European minded person. Or more specifically, if you're a person who believes in a, I would say, triad of ideas, these ideas which go back to the heroic ideal that I'm always talking about, a triad of ideas that say, number one, merit is good, and how we should base things is upon merit. Two, that says, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. If you want to get something done, you gotta do it yourself. And number three, that says, 
You got to do both of these things under a rational norm. If you believe any of that, and certainly if you believe all three of those things, if you believe in merit, if you believe in hard work, if you believe in rationality, you, my friend, you're like me. You have a target on your back. And this coming winter, you're going to be targeted. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like. Hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. And don't forget, my graphic novel launches this coming Friday, the 15th of January, 2021. So if you wish to receive your free exclusive pinup poster with your book, if you order it, you must sign up at the Coming Soon page, which the link is in the description. And by the way, I've also linked my new trailer for my graphic novel there as well, so you can watch that while you're there. It's only about six minutes long. Hopefully you're all as excited as I am about my coming graphic novel. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye.